This is Took, Chapter 17. The next day, Mrs. O'Neill picked me up around three. Celine huddled in the back seat, hugging the doll, her face mournful. Snowflakes drifted in the gray air, floating up and down, swirling like tiny moths. By the time we parked in front of Miss Perkins' house, an inch of fluffy snow coated the old snow, making it look fresh and new. We walked to the front door, silently. No one had said much during the ride into Woodville. I think we were each locked in our own thoughts, wondering what Mrs. Perkins might tell us. Each of us hoping, hoping, hoping. We waited on the cold porch for at least five minutes before the door opened, and Miss Perkins stepped aside to let us enter. Three cats shot out of the house, and two ran in. Inside, it was a dark and cold and smelly as before. A small fire burned low on the hearth, but we didn't take off our coats. For a while, no one spoke. It was as if we were waiting for Miss Perkins to tell us something, and she was waiting for us to tell her something. A black cat crept into her lap, and two more emerged from the shadows to crouch at her feet. They watched us steadily, unblinking. I wondered how she told them apart. The fire popped and crackled, and the wind did its best to squeeze in through every crack. Celine coughed. Mrs. O'Neill crossed and uncrossed her ankles. Somewhere in the back of the house, a cat yowled. There must be dozens of them, I thought, mostly black-gray and dark tabbies. This is how it is, Miss Perkins said suddenly. Celine, there's no way you can go back to my auntie. She don't want you no more. You must learn to live in the here and now, or die. Them's your choices. If I was you, I'd choose to live. Tears ran down Celine's face, but she said nothing. She simply sat and stared, as if she were a cat too, half wild, not one you dared to pet. Miss Perkins turned her eyes to me. She means to keep your sister for fifty years, she said, just like she kept Celine and all the ones before her. There must be something you can do, I whispered. My family is wrecked, my mother, my father. I couldn't go on without losing my self-control and throwing myself at her feet, crying and begging for her help. I didn't say there was no way to get your sister back, Miss Perkins spoke sharply. The cat on her lap raised its head, startled out of its nap. Have you actually spoken to her? Mrs. O'Neill asked. Not exactly, Miss Perkins stroked the cat on her lap. I got my ways of finding out things on the sly. Things folks don't want me to know. Things I don't want them to know I'm interested in. Mrs. O'Neill nodded as if she understood, but like me, I was sure she didn't quite see what the old woman meant. But she was a witch, and we weren't, so why should we expect to understand? Miss Perkins stretched a hand toward Celine. Bring me that dolly, dear. Celine gripped the doll. What do you want her with her? She's mine. The old woman leaned toward Celine and stared into her eyes. The dolly, she said. Give me the dolly. The air seemed charged with electricity, and my skin tingled as if a thunderstorm were rolling through the house. I wanted to jump up and run from the dark, from the craziness of the old woman, but something kept me where I was. Celine rose slowly and gave the doll to Miss Perkins. Good girl, she said, as Celine backed away and collapsed on the sofa. Mrs. O'Neill put her arm around her. For once, Celine did not pull away. In the meantime, Miss Perkins turned the doll this way and that, studying her intently in the dim light of the fire. She caressed little Erica, moved her arms and legs and hummed to herself as if she'd forgotten we were in the room. After a minute or so, she bent her head over the cat in her lap and seemed to listen. He made a strange sound, not a meow, not a growl, not a purr, but something like all three. She nodded her head slowly. At last, Miss Perkins looked up. Her eyes seemed unfocused as if she weren't seeing us or the room, but was looking at something far away. Celine and I moved closer to Mrs. O'Neill. She held us both tightly. Miss Perkins slowly came back to the room and the fire and the three of us. Her sharp eyes fixed themselves on me. 
Come here, boy. Come close. Even though I wanted to stay where I was, safe and warm beside Mrs. O'Neill, I did what she said. The old woman smiled, smelled of dried grass and herbs and flowers. A nice smell. I sniffed and breathed it in, feeling it spread through me like magic. How much do you want your sister back, boy? She whispered. Her eyes probed mine. I'd do anything to get her away from Auntie. Will you go to Auntie's cabin tonight? All by yourself? No mammy, no pappy, nobody. All by yourself, just you. Are you brave enough? I stared at her, almost speechless. Tonight? You said you want your sister back. You said you'll do anything. This is the onlyest way to do it. I glanced at Mrs. O'Neill to see what she thought. Her eyes were open, but unfocused. As blank as little Erica's eyes. She and Celine seemed to be in a trance. Miss Perkins leaned toward me and studied my face. You brave enough? Because if you ain't, you'll never see your sister till 50 years from now. And that one there will be soon, and that one there will soon be dead. She nodded at Celine. It's for both these girls you're doing it. You break the spell for your sister, you break it for Celine too. Once the spell's broke, Annie will be finished. The dark will take her. I tried to stand tall and straight. Maybe if I acted brave, I'd be brave. What do I have to do? My voice came out in a squeak. You go to the door of the cabin at midnight, not one minute earlier, not one minute later. Knock three times. Auntie will call out, who's that knock, knock, knocking at my door? You'll say, a poor traveler lost in the cold. She'll say, what you want with me? You'll say, to sit by your fire a spell. Miss Perkins stroked the cat's black fur and crooned to him. Except for the wind and the fire, the room was as still as death. She'll ask you to tell her a riddle, she went on. First you say, I brung you a cherry without a stone. Miss Perkins reached into her pocket and drew out a blossom. She laid it carefully on the table beside her. A cherry don't have a stone when it's blooming. Second say, I brung you a chicken without a bone. Miss Perkins took an egg from her pocket and laid it beside the blossom. A chicken don't have bones while it's in the egg. They're old riddles, she said. Everyone knows the answers, so she'll ask for something harder. A riddle she's never heard before. The old woman coughed and sniffed and fidgeted with the doll. Last of all, say, I brung you a servant that never tires and never grows old. She added little Erica to the objects on the table. It ain't a riddle she'll have heard before. If she can't guess the answer in three tries, she's got to open the door and let you in. My heart knocked about in my chest, hammering and pounding my ribs. But when she sees me, she'll know who I am. Auntie ain't the onlyest one that knows her way around the dark side of the moon. I got tricks of my own, boy. She won't know you. I'll see to that. The cat interrupted her with an odd questioning sort of noise. Miss Perkins stroked him till he purred loud enough to make my bones vibrate. Soon as you're through the door, she went on, Annie will ask you for the answer to the riddle. Open the sack and show her the servant that never tires and never grows old. Once she sees that dolly, she'll forget about your sister. At least for a while. But, I couldn't stop myself from interrupting the old woman again. She knows the doll belongs to Erica, and how can a doll be a servant? She's plastic. She's not alive. She can't move or talk or... Hush up and quit asking fool questions. You got to trust me, boy. Get your sister out of the cabin as fast as you can. She won't want to come. You'll have to drag her away. Run for home like you got wings on your heels or seven league boots on your feet. But what if... Don't vex me no more, boy. Do what I tell you. Bring your sister home, and the spell must, and the spell will bust at sunrise for both girls. They'll remember who they are in this world, but they won't remember nothing about Auntie's world. Miss Perkins scrunched her face into a tight fist, and the cat lashed his tail and hissed at me. My brain whirled with questions, but my voice had dried up and my mouth felt numb, the way it does in the dentist's office when he gives you Novocaine. I nodded as if I understood and hoped I'd be able to do all she asked. Miss Perkins put my sister's doll into a burlap sack, tied it shut, and gave it to me. No matter what, 
Don't open the sack until you're inside the cabin, and don't be scared of the dolly. Before I could ask her why I'd be scared of a doll, she gave me a warning look, and I shut my mouth. Miss Perkins nodded, took a deep breath, and let it out slowly. Now go sit on that sofa and keep your mouth shut about everything I done told you. Miss Perkins nodded, took a deep breath, and let it out slowly. Now go sit on that sofa and keep your mouth shut about everything I just done told you. I took my place next to Mrs. O'Neill, who continued to stare straight ahead as at, at nothing I could see. Miss Perkins murmured a few words to the cat. The moment he closed his eyes, Mrs. O'Neill and Celine came back from wherever they'd been. They stretched and yawned as if they'd been napping. Celine looked bewildered, as if she wasn't quite sure where she was, although I expected her to ask about the doll. She didn't say a word. Thank you for your time, Mrs. O'Neill, said to Miss Perkins. I'm sorry you can't do anything to help us. That poor child. Fifty years is a long time. The years will go by in a flash, Miss Perkins picked up a ball of yarn and her knitting, a lumpy black scarf already long enough to wrap two or three times around her neck. Gently helping Celine to her feet, Mrs. O'Neill turned to me. Come along, Daniel. The snow's getting worse. Your parents must be worried. See yourselves out. Miss Perkins said. I'm a mite weary tonight. When you're old as me, the cold settles in your bones and sets them to aching and scraping against each other. Good night, then, Mrs. O'Neill said. Take care of yourself, Miss Perkins. You too, dearie, and don't fret yourself about the snow. It'll stop soon enough. We left Miss Perkins sitting by the fire, knitting and humming to herself, while the cat dozed on her lap. Outside, the cold air froze the hairs in my nose, and my eyes watered but I was glad to be away from the smoky smell of the house. I kept the sack behind my back, but no one noticed it. Celine sat behind me with her nose pressed against the window and watched the empty streets of Woodville glide past. A flake or two of snow drifted past the windshield, but Miss Perkins was right. The moon was already breaking through the clouds. As usual, our house looked dark and vacant. As it had the previous night, a lamp glimmered in Mom's bedroom window but the downstairs windows were lit only by the headlights of the car. Mrs. O'Neill stared at the house. My goodness, Daniel, is anyone home? They're upstairs, I said. The light's on in the bedroom. Dad's office is in the back. That's where he is, where he always is, lost in computer games and websites for missing children. As I opened the car door, she asked, Do you want me to come in with you? No, it's okay. Everything's fine. What a good liar I was getting to be. Thanks for taking me to see Miss Perkins again. While we talked, I was aware of Celine watching me through the window. I waved to her, but she turned away. Mrs. O'Neill said goodbye and turned around slowly, her headlights washing over the unpainted sides of our house. I watched the taillights grow small as the car disappeared around the curve in the driveway. The kitchen looked the way it always did, sink full of dirty dishes, trash can overflowing with pizza boxes, beer cans, and wine bottles, table littered with newspapers, paper plates, coffee cups, forks and knives and spoons, and empty wine bottles, ashtrays heaped with cigarette butts. Dad? Mom? I called. Up here, Dad answered. I climbed in the back, I climbed the back stairs slowly, keeping the sack behind my back. It was the new normal. Dad playing a war game on the computer, Mom huddled in her room under a quilt reading. We saved some pizza for you, Mom said. It's in the fridge. Just heat it up in the microwave. Thanks. I stowed the sack under my bed and went down to the kitchen to warm up the pizza. The crust tasted like burned cardboard, and the cheese had turned to something that resembled melted plastic and stuck to my teeth, but I ate it anyway. I was going to be out in the cold a long time. I needed something in my belly. For a while, I sat at the table and watched the clock. 7 p.m. 8 p.m. Time crept past. Upstairs, my parents were silently engrossed in their books and games. I said goodnight to them and went to my room. They barely acknowledged my presence. If It was as if I'd disappeared, too. If I failed tonight, if bloody bones killed and ate me, would they care? Would they send anyone to look for me, or would they just sink deeper and deeper into the house? burrowing under blankets, eating bad pizza, drinking, smoking, not even noticing I was gone. For at least an hour, I stood at my window, trying to remember the way our family used to be, 
but only seeing myself teasing Erica, making her cry, forcing her to leave the doll in the woods. Why had I been so mean to her? I shivered in the cold air that leaked through those win to, through loose window panes and watched the wind blow the clouds away. The moon sailed into sight and shone on the snowy fields. In its bright light, I saw the beginning of the path that led to Auntie's cabin. I glanced at my clock. 10.30. It was time to go.